That's like believing that you understand Los Angeles if you have the telephone directory. You know? I mean, this is the level of genetics today. What they say, they say they understand life and they have the telephone directory and they're talking about Los Angeles because they can look up, you know, where the genes are, the coding for the proteins, you know, does this tell us anything about a broken heart or a messiah or a Hitler? I don't think so. So what we are trying to do is return the focus of attention to individual experience. We have been slave too long to ideology transmitted hierarchically and based on a tremendously alienating instrumentality. That's what science depends on now, a tremendously alienating instrumentality. What we need to do is empower experience. Well, this is where the psychedelics come in because citizens don't take psychedelics because it's illegal. Neither do marionettes, neither do robots. None of these well-behaved and mechanistic reductionist images of humanity take psychedelics because it's misbehaving. Misbehaving is a great sin. In fact, it's enshrined as the first sin. You'll regard that the psychedelic issue was there in Eden and somebody misbehaved and then they got tossed out forever and their children's children into the chaos of history. It's interesting to read in Genesis why this was. It was because they will become as we are, says Yahweh. They will become as we are if they eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. They say we're young and we don't know. We won't find out till we grow. I don't know if all that's true. Cause you got me and baby, I got you. Baby. I Ladies and gentlemen. You having a nightmare? What if it's true? Ladies and gentlemen. Alan, it's a possibility, isn't it? The very word secrecy is repugnant. Secrets. In a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers constant extreme danger which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger, extreme danger, that an announced need for increased security. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Carr. Will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. You're crazy. And no officious, high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes. Isn't the Pentagon suspicious that all the building would blow up? Or to withhold from the press and the public. I think you're just looking at things for the first time. The facts they deserve to know. You've had your whole fucking life to think things over. What good's a few minutes more gonna do you now? The facts they deserve to know. They deserve to know.
deserve to know. Deserve to know. Welcome to episode 119 and 47 of Green Crush Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Facts they deserve to know. Welcome to episode 119 and 47. It's an eggplant digital media creation. It's eggplant digital media. Some of the most innovative and exciting digital media out there and when i say out there i mean out here of course in the calm space man it's hot out and i'm loving it there's people that get really upset about the heat but um i find that it comes so quickly on the heels of the freezing cold that it doesn't bother me at all it's like i've been waiting for it so here we are at Eggplant Digital Media again, 234 King Street East in Toronto at the Pacific Function Hotel. I'll get to that later. It's Eggplant Digital Media, some of the most innovative and exciting digital media out there. And did you know there's a full shooting schedule or recording schedule or both like you're watching now? Uh, end to end. We got daytime programs all the way through. Every morning in the, uh, the weekdays are kicked off by Mike Richards, raw Mike Richards. And I don't even know who else is on, but we have Your Hood's a Joke. That's a good show and a lot of other shows. So we're going to have to get some of that information together so that I can talk about it on the show. This is not the only good show that comes out of this particular uh, organization of uh, information freaks. So uh, check us out. This is where we are at 234 King Street East in the Pacific Junction Hotel. The hotel for your specific function. Is that too vague? Pacific Junction specific function? Is that you, you get you get that, right? Well, well the food's great and you meet fun people. That's the main thing. Our guest today on Green Crush Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park is he's an author. You know, and I could just leave it at that. I could leave it at that because I'd like to be an author and I'm not an author and I should be an author and one day hopefully I'll, I'll be an author. But this guy's more than an author. He's a results-oriented operational leader. What does that mean? Well, he's had 50 years of experience in the entertainment industry. So his book, his writings are about the entertainment industry, specifically the music industry. We have John Hartman in today. John is the brother of Paul Hartman, who is the, the gun on the show here. We get him on once in a while. Sometimes he comes to the city. He's a good friend. And his brother is John Hartman. Of course, uh, John is the older uh, of the two and the eldest of the three. Uh, of course, Phil Hartman, who's no longer with us, uh, the, being the, uh, the middle brother. So, John, this whole family has been deeply involved in all things uh, Hollywood and California, from Paul's growing stuff and uh, and moving it around. To, uh, and by that, I mean, you know, cannabis. And um, and then we have here, John is, uh, he was recently, it was a couple of years ago, three years ago, he got the Heller Award. That's a lifetime achievement and management in Hollywood. It's a crystal trophy. And it was presented by his very first client, Jenny Clyde. And you might remember her. She was uh, in the rock duo Chad and Jenny. Well, you'd have to be old to remember her because, uh, you know, that was a long time ago. But that was the British invasion of Chad and Jenny. But um, and John also teaches. He is at the Musicians Institute in Hollywood. That's when he started anyway. He's the founder of the Hollow Diamond Internet company engaged in the creation and execution of the new music industry paradigm. The holodime is to ensure that the next generation of music belongs to those who make it. 
And it, it will raise a series of uh, questions I've wanted to have answered for a long, long time about music and concerts and, and hollow something else. So John will be on shortly. And of course, uh, he will be speaking uh, to some measure about cannabis, because why else would he be on the show? You can't just be a family member. You know, I don't have Devin is in here right now as our uh, operator while Russell's away. I don't have Devin's mom come down here and have a chat, right? She's not involved in this. I'm sure she's a wonderful woman. <laughs> Maybe she is involved. Who knows? What am I saying? She could be the mother on weeds. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, so that's who's on today. John Hartman, he'll be on shortly. Now, remember, as for government-sponsored personal minister profit models, boycott all government weed. That's the message here at the show. Consume it where you choose to. You know, whichever weed you want to have. Choose that and, and have it where you're going to have it, within reason. Don't blow smoke in people's faces. That's why these other folks had to draw up those laws. But vape and vape and oil yourself to contentment. I had a phone call with a friend the other day or a text back and forth. He showed me a letter from his um, condominium board. Apparently the place that he owns is telling him that he won't be able to smoke cannabis inside of his apartment that he's dropped well north of $300,000 to live inside of. And to this I say, don't get too hung up about that. Learn how to vape. Vape and edibles. You don't really need to smoke. It's, it's probably not the best way. Now, considering it burns off somewhere in the neighborhood of 85% of all the goodness that is a cannabis experience, eh, just vape. Uh, which is another fantastic way to say to hell with your condominium board telling you you can't partake of a medicine and or a recreational item. Everybody's so precious about this. Remember, we have this government that tells us on the one hand, it's dangerous. And on the other hand, we don't have enough information to know anything about it. You can't have those two brains uh, in the same uh, body. It doesn't work that way. So vape, vape, vape. Understand what vaping is. Boy, there's some good vaporizers out there. I know one that I use is called the Shatterizer. It's so good that I have two of them. I do. I have two of them. Um, one of them is for um, shatter, and the other one is for the oil that I uh, sometimes medicate myself with. Uh, the black, tarry Rick Simpson goop that pulled my scraggly ass from the edge of a grave, only to deposit me this far on the other side of it. And it's such a different world now than when I was going down in flames. I can't believe it. <laughs> so it's it's kind of every day is a bit of a... A bit of a surprise to me and uh, bonus time of craziness. But anyway, do that. Don't listen to Julie and Fantino and Bill Blair and all of these other people that are granting you permission to use something that they've already put dozens, perhaps hundreds, perhaps thousands of people in jail for. And now they're going to profit from it. So to hell with them. Obtain your own quality seeds. Not yet infected by the metastases going on with the Bayer-Monsanto merger. Come on. That's an antitrust. Very much need an antitrust suit there. Bayer and Monsanto merging. I don't know exactly what level that is at, but it is unspeakable. So it shouldn't be at any other level uh, other than, boy, thank goodness that's not happening. So make sure it doesn't. Fight it the best way you can. Find out about it. Don't let them influence uh, uh, your shopping uh, needs and abilities. And, and certainly don't let them lobby their way into being the only available kind of weed some 8, 6, 10, 15 years down the road. Grow your own plant once you've gotten your own seed. Consume the plant as food. Consume it as a tea. Consume it as a regular component of salad. Forget kale and iceberg lettuce. This plant is food. Grow it. Eat it. Vape it. Convert it into oil. And take control of your own health, your own way, your own life and away from these obsessed and obsessive control freak pigs. 
And by that, I don't just mean the police that would arrest you for having it. I mean anybody that would give you a hard time for having it. Because, you know, if you want to consume it in a social setting, as we are encouraged to do with alcohol, which is a depressant, do that with your cannabis. Have a party. Create a floating speakeasy system in your town to help keep the cops running around your town and failing miserably at finding where you're at. Just keep moving it around. We always, these resistance people <laughs> that, that don't seem to be able to fully get the message across to these alleged overlords that we're going to be having this on our own time and our own measure. And uh, it's really criminal to do it any other way. There's no real representation to any of this. None. We'll get into that in a future show. we got some of those uh, shows coming up. They're constitutionally themed shows. Doesn't that sound exciting? <laughs> oh, my. But it, it goes to show you that we it, it, it works to expose the fact that the entire structure that we uh, give our um, ascension to, that we allow to rise and rule over us, is not really rooted in anything beyond you just going along with it. So you don't necessarily need to do that. Let's get into some news. There's been some big news, and I always love when there's news in Hamilton because uh, Hamilton is <laughs> Hamilton is the best. So uh, we're moving on to Hamilton. Okay, so what's going on in Hamilton? And this comes to us from the CBC. All uh, right, from July 9th, the Hamilton police shut down dozens of pot dispensaries and all but two reopened again. That's right, folks. That's the way it's always going to go. It's always going to go that way. You're going to try to repress us and we're going to go, eh, boom, take it on the chin and open it up somewhere else. You're never going to win. The reason we're at this juncture now is because that maxim was always true. And now you're just dilly-dallying and being dicks about it. It says that it's a clear sign the city of Hamilton is losing its battle against the illegal. Now remember when we say this, that it's only the, the words of the people who want to take control of cannabis across the board that are calling it illegal. Okay, these are all cast spells. All right, so just be careful when you're reading or listening to anything, really. It's, um, it's a battle that they are losing against illegal marijuana dispensaries. Now, again, they should be calling it cannabis. Every time police or the city try to shut one down, the new numbers show, they just open it back up again. Lloyd Ferguson, Ancaster Counselor and Chair of the Police Services Board, says police have shut down 42 dispensaries. Now remember, this is a little uh, uh, another window to how nuts this is. Uh, Hamilton is, is a is a nice little town in Ontario, and uh, Ontario is planning to open forty stores between um, October eighteenth and October eighteenth, twenty nineteen. They're going to get forty stores open across a very large geographical mass, and right now there are forty two stores in Hamilton that were shut down and 40 of them have reopened. And the, I think the odds are good that the other two will also reopen. City efforts aren't much better. It's because it's unsustainable, you fucking idiots. You can't do this. We're just going to keep rolling out our freedoms. Bylaw staff. Oh, God. How do you even drag yourself out of bed in the morning when you realize you're part of a collective known as a bylaw staff. Ugh. Uh, they've identified 80 dispensaries in total. So there's 80 now. There's 80, there's twice as many dispensaries in this small town of Hamilton than there are going to be across the entire province. I keep saying this because it's not my idea. It's stupid AF. And I just don't understand why more people don't realize how far down the garden path we're all being led. 
33 that the authorities managed to close, most of them just moved to a different location and reop reopened. That shows the system isn't working. Leandertz says, uh, Leandertzy, I'm sorry about that name. Ken Leandertzy, Leandertz, Leandertz? Probably Dutch, you got two E's there, Leandertz. Uh, the city tries to use existing rules to crack down, including whether a building is zoned properly or whether edibles are stored, but that's all it can do until the province either makes dispensaries legal or gives them better tools. Like more money for cops in a police state. That'd be a good idea. I wonder if they've even considered that. The city needs the ability to issue heavy enough fines to act as a deterrent. Until then, the process of trying to close the dispensary is long and labor-intensive and morally reprehensible. They left that part out. I added that part in there. Okay, so what else is in the news? This has to be covered. We have to get to this. Um, thank you very much, Forbes magazine. This is the magazine for people with far more uh, monetary means than I uh, have. Uh, I can tell you that for sure. Here, here it is. Uh, here's a great article. It's in Forbes. It's called Why Synth Synthetic Marijuana is More Dangerous Than Ever. Okay, so you read this. It says, Last week, New York City television footage showed young men slumped over chairs while others were dazed and wandering the sidewalks and streets. One was inexplicably prancing around with a bowling ball. Another was hunched over and holding onto his bicycle. A man who broadcast the Street View on Facebook Live said it looked like a scene out of a zombie movie. In the Bronx and Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood, more than 130 people were hospitalized with what's being described as overdoses of K2 or spice, an intoxicant widely described as synthetic marijuana. We talked about this spice before. It makes your eyes bleed and stuff, right? So it's a really dangerous thing. And, and the other reason is not just spice, but synthesizing cannabis. It cannot... It will not, it doesn't provide any of the positive benefits and the relief of actually taking in the plant. And when I say it doesn't bring any benefit at all from the synthetic version, uh, the only place I'm not correct about that is, of course, the, um, the bank accounts and the ledgers of the companies that provide those synthetic drugs. These people have also been fighting cannabis. But just remember, synthetic marijuana, that's not what we're talking about. Never take that stuff. It's garbage. And besides, when things really shake out the way they're supposed to be, weed is only two, three bucks a gram, not even, uh, in some places, right, Oregon? So, uh, you know, you, you have to... Um, you have to understand that this whole thing is a ruse. This is just a way for people to make money, and it doesn't work. And we've had all these spice attacks. And so, public message of the show, don't take synthetic marijuana. Okay, so why is synthetic marijuana so addictive and dangerous? Well, in Herb.co, yes, H E R B contains none of the natural cannabinoids found in the real thing. The dirty little secret is that one reason synth marijuana probably should be referred to as marijuana at all. Make no mistake about it, the high is different from actual cannabis, as are the potential dangers. Synthetic cannabinoid analogs, often known as full agonists for the CB1 and CB2 receptors in the brain, and other places in your body. THC and the rest of the natural cannabinoids found in marijuana, on the other hand, are only partial agonists. This means that when it comes to effects, that synthetic cannabinoids have greatly exaggerated effects compared to cannabis. It also means that synthetic marijuana lends itself more easily to abuse than real weed and unfortunately means that unlike the real stuff, it can actually kill you. Now, this is where the science is. You want to get on the science. You want to understand the science about this. This is a recent article from May 9th of this year, 2018. Well, what has the government got to say about all this? What, what are we going to find out about them? What's their position on, on, we know where they're at with real weed. And Terrence McKenna talked about it at the beginning of the show. They don't want us all lapping and, and happily munching out on the, uh, the fruits of the tree of good and evil. 
knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so let's let's find out from last year in uh, Vice News. Says here that the DEA, that's the Drug Enforcement Agency, this is just late last year, seven months ago or so. The DEA has officially decided da, 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 that a notorious fentanyl manufacturer's synthetic marijuana product is safer and more medicinally valuable than actual weed. So, I mean, here we go with the lies again. Are you with me? So we just uh, we just understood how this shit's poison. And now we have the most recent position of the government of the United States, the Drug Enforcement Agency, is telling you this stuff that can bleed out of your eyes is, uh, you know, it's not as bad as you think. In an announcement posted in the Federal Register, the DEA announced that the drug Syndros, a liquid form of synthetic THC, will be classified as a Schedule II controlled substance, meaning it can be legally prescribed by doctors. We live in a society of demons, okay? That is just about what it is. I'm sure there's a 10% psychopath count on the population in general, and they're spread out there, and it's always a problem for the 90 rest of us. Um, But when it comes to finding the halls of power, these folks are driven to it. And so just because we have 5 or 3 or 10% psychopaths wandering around just outside this window. No offense. <laughs> Come here, sir. You're a psychopath. Uh, we, don't, we don't know exactly how many are out there, but there are far more aggregated into the halls of power. Okay, so, like, for example, listen to this guy. New cannabis fines have been released. And unlike alcohol, cannabis retailers face penalties that are fixed. And in some cases, higher. Yeah, it's higher than uh, a lot of these cases are higher than alcohol. Now, that's not just a pun on cannabis getting you high. That's Here we have a politician. Now, I know it's only in one half. That's okay. He's going to explain some of this. Cannabis is, is new. Uh, Pardon? I'm sorry? What was that, fucko? Cannabis is new. Don Morgan, this this guy's a fella. He's a politician in Saskatchewan. Look him up. Cannabis is new. I think what he means is it's it's new as a legalized substance. So that doesn't really mean that you've got a you know a purview over it. That's just. But go on. We're worried about what the effect might be, so we're starting with a higher penalty structure. Alcohol is something that's been around for as long as the province has been been in existence, and it's something where people have got a a greater understanding and acceptance and marijuana is something new so we want to have a, a greater disincentive at least at the beginning okay so just at the beginning so if we can hold any of these uh, wannabe uh, you know arbiters of justice to their point uh, after a little bit of time we should be able to shake them down into opening things up to uh, to a little bit more than this parochial nonsense they've got it set to right now but we know why they're trying to keep it away from us I mean we talked about that They want to keep it away from us. They want to tax it. They want to tell us how dangerous it is. And every once in a while, some information comes to the fore that um, belittles that notion. Here's one. Going to get to our guest in a minute, but hang on. This is in the Toronto Star. The chief medical officer calls for decriminalization of all drugs for personal use. (coughs) What? The chief medical officer... Of what? Toronto, pretty big city in North America, calling for decriminalization of all drugs for personal use. Now we're getting somewhere. Bill Blair, Toronto's medical officer of health, is pushing for the decriminalization of all drugs for personal use as part of a shift to a public health approach to overdose prevention. In the midst of a deadly and worsening crisis, Dr. Eileen Davila could be Davia, is urging the city's Board of Health to call on the federal government to decriminalize possession of drugs for personal use while scaling up prevention, harm, and reduction in treatment services, as opposed to arresting and busting services where they hurt people and take their money and ruin their families like the police like to do. She's also recommending Ottawa convene a task force made up of people who use drugs. Holy shit! What a great idea! Not just go to the cops right away? Medical officer, not just go to the police and ask them how they're going to reschedule their income if cannabis isn't a bust-worthy substance anymore? 
Oh, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, you should have tried that in Ottawa before, folks. <laughs> the first people they're going to ask are the people who use them. Great. Alongside experts in policy and health care and human rights and mental health and criminal justice experts. See, that's how the, the list needs to run. You don't go to a cop first and ask a cop to redesign the structure of, of how the cannabis system is going to run when all of a sudden him and his boys are going to have dozens uncountable uh, hours on the ledger that where they're not arresting people. Ergo, it's time to shave off that many cops on the roster. I mean, you don't even need a budget as high as you've got it anymore. Let's not stop. Let's stop kidding ourselves. You don't need as many cops. You don't have as many hours if you really go to legal. That's what these punks are all upset about. And they don't want us to have the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Whether you like that metaphorically or literally. So she wants to put money into scaling prevention and harm and, and uh, harm reduction and treatment services. That makes sense, huh? She's also recommending that task force be made of people who use drugs. Might even ask them why they were using it, right? They might even ask me. Like, if I was to be asked by this doctor, she would say, well, why are you using it? Why did you use it? Did you find it cut into your existence? Did you find that you, you weren't very productive with it? And I would say, well, no, I, I was going to find out I was fucking dead without it. So thanks for asking me first, and then experts in policy. We'll get to you later. And then healthcare, because you've been denying things and buttressing the pharmaceutical industry. And then human rights. Well, we should move that a little closer up, but thanks for considering it at all. And then mental health and criminal justice experts. Mental health experts, because we need to definitely take care of people in that situation. But again, we also don't need to be told that their particular pharmacy is the only way out of these particular situations. I'm going to talk about ibogaine later on. Look that up. I-B-O-G-A-I-N-E. To explore options for the legal regulation of all drugs in Canada. God love her. Those are the positions detailed in a new report entitled A Public Health Approach to Drug Policy that will be presented to the city's health board. And I'm sure it's already in the garbage can. <laughs> I'm sure it is already in the garbage can. But we'll see. I'll, I'll try to take a... I'm going to keep that on my little... Uh, pegboard of things I'm supposed to do and uh, we'll take a look at that in a little bit because I want to make sure that that gets uh, you know followed up this is the continuing conversation Kathleen Wynne uh, that you bailed out of zero spine in that woman none okay so that's our previous um, getting off on a rant here I just don't miss her that's all even though the, the guy that's in there now well, we'll talk about him later I'm sure anyway that's the news and then we're going to bring on our guest now what do you think yeah okay so um, let's go to the old squealy really there we go here um, oh great my lawyer is on the phone we're going to pass on that right now He's on the phone. Did I say my lawyer is on the phone? Oh, my goodness. He is on the phone. You know, you're going to get in trouble. And um, it's going to happen at some point with this whole cannabis mess. You know, I don't think I'm out of the woods on that at all. Let me let me just mention this to you right now. That uh, you, you may find yourself in some kind of cannabis trouble. And that will suck. Because... Here at Green Crush and Green Crush Conspiracy Queries, we've been telling you the new system's been screwed for over a year now. And some of you, well, you're only now learning of the draconian rollout of this particular cannabis act. You're only now finding out about it. You're only finding out that it's nothing more than boiling hot pig gravy being poured over the castle walls onto the just citizens the rightful citizens and these guys have gamed the system so if you find yourself on the short end of the stick and you need a lawyer a real one who deals with cannabis not the one who untangles you from a lying black widow but i mean you know the one where you got busted for some kind of weed thing it's possible that this will be the only guy you need at that point I hope it never happens to you, but it's possible you may wind up getting yourself involved with Harrison Jordan. He's an attorney at law in Ontario. He studied the weed laws, and he knows them better than you. 
Hurt in a car? Do not call me. Get caught smoking a bong while driving on the 401? I may be able to help. Hi, I'm Harrison Jordan, and whether you find yourself on the wrong side of the pot law, or you'd like to start a business in the legal marijuana industry, you need someone who understands Canada's cannabis laws. So call me today at 1-855-420-LAW. 1-855-420-LAW. All right, Harrison Jordan making his own commercials. He just got called to the bar. Now he's making his own commercials. I believe he's singing in there as well. That's amazing. So uh, that's our buddy Harrison. He's now a lawyer. He was articling. Uh, that's cool. I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to, to get him going on there. So here we go. We're going to call him. Um, we're going to call Mr. John Hartman. He is somewhere in California. <clears throat> and let's find out exactly where. Probably Los Angeles, right? If he's still working. I guess he would be. It's earlier in the day for him. Hello, John Hartman here. Hey, John, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Okay, I'm pretty good. We're going to play with some sound levels here. Is that all right? Okay, now... I'm very, I'm very excited. I, I don't know if you heard the beginning of the show, but um, the folks know who you are. You're a music manager and everything. At the beginning of the show, I played some Sonny and Cher. What do you think about that? Uh, one of my favorites. Yeah. When did you, let's just jump right in and say, when did you meet Sonny and Cher? What was that all about? I don't know who you are. You're a music manager and everything. At the beginning of the show, I played some Sonny. Wow, there's a big delay there. Um, yes, shoot, that's. Yeah, we're on the air. That was a huge delay. Go ahead and say hi there. Hi there. I'm back. Okay. Um, I don't know why I heard me 30 seconds later. You heard that too, huh? Okay, let me just ask you again. We're just going to dive in out of nowhere because I wound up using Sonny and Cher. How did you, I mean, you're a music uh, manager. How did you meet Sonny and Cher and tell us about that? They were they were like an international superstar team. Well, I was um, an agent at the William Morris Agency, I was 23 years old. My assignments were scale television shows and game shows. And the first time that rock and roll music was put on prime time network television was a show on ABC called uh, Findig. Uh, that was a show that I worked on regularly and submitted William Moore's clients to. And uh, I happened to be pretty intensely into it. And um, I represented the director, Dean Whitmore, uh, the house chanteuse, Donna Lauren, the house duet, Dick and Dee Dee. Uh, I signed the house quintet, the shin dogs, to William Morris. And I spent uh, a lot of time at their rehearsals. And, uh, God, and uh, some crazy noise here. So I was, um, I was at one of the tapings, and the uh, Rolling Stones were on the stage um, playing uh, one of their hits, and um, there was an audience of about 300 kids, and they were all ignoring the Rolling Stones, which I found quite shocking. And um, so... I, the, they were calling to someone standing in the wings behind uh, uh, a drape. And I, I went around the corner and looked at to see what had their attention, and it was Sonny Bono. <laughs> Sonny uh, was the first guy in L.A. to have long hair. Uh, the Beatles had hair to their cheekbones and... Uh, and the stones had him to their neck, but no one had him below the neck. <laughs> and uh, somehow, um, Sonny and Cher were an unknown act at the time, but the kids knew who they were. So there was an underground uh, movement for them. And uh, this I found very shocking, that they would ignore the Rolling Stones and pay attention to uh, this unknown artist. So later in that show, Sonny and Cher did a song. And... Um, a week later, and I, I, you know, thought it was pretty cool, and uh, she was lovely. And uh, about a week later, the um, ABC network had allowed uh, the cast and crew of Jindig to be on a, uh, uh, a benefit concert at the Shrine Auditorium in L.A. 
the benefit was for um, UNICEF. So I had all these clients on the show. It's a live show. It wasn't on television. It was just the audience that had paid to admission. And uh, I was sitting up in the balcony, and um, Sonny uh, and Cher were on the bill. And uh, when, uh, without introduction, actually, she comes, uh, the song comes on uh, the uh, speakers, and she walks out of the wings alone with a handheld mic, and she... Um, she, uh, hold on a second, she, uh, she's singing a song called Just You, and uh, so she comes out, and she, or no, actually, it's Sonny who comes out first, Okay. and he's, he's singing this song, Just You, and, um, and he sits at the edge of the stage, and in the Shrine Auditorium, the first row of seats is just like three feet from the stage, uh, downstage edge. And so he's singing right into the faces of the kids. And then when he finishes his verse, she starts the answer verse, and she comes out of the wings. She sits down beside him, and she strokes his long hair. And I got goosebumps over my entire body. And I jumped out of my seat and I ran down the back stairs and backstage. And by the time I got there, they had finished their song. And I went up to Sonny Bono and I said, I want to be your agent. And he said, you do? As he knew, I represented everybody else on the show. And uh, I said, yes, I do. And so uh, long story short... Uh, I got a I got a picture of them, and I went around the Morris office. I was in the television department, and I had to get someone in the live concert department to co-sign the act with me because someone had to book gigs on that. And so um, I went around with this photo of them, and I and I showed it to all the agents. I said, "We got to sign this act," and. Um, he says, and everybody said, no, don't do it. You know, it's your career. You're going to blow your career. You got lucky on the uh, last signing. Uh, I signed an English act called Chad and Jeremy that broke wide open. And, uh, you know, these, this guy's got long hair. That, are you crazy? And he's wearing a fur vest. And I said, I, you no, know, no, we got to sign him. We got to sign him. And, and I went to the head of the rock department. And he said, no, don't do it. We don't need this act. We got lots of acts. Book, book the ones we have. And I said, and I, and I'm only a kid. And I said, I, I'm going to sign this act with or without you guys. And so they said, okay. The guy says, uh, his name was Ira Oaken, and he said, it's your career. If you've got to sign him, sign him. So I, I got a, a, a young agent from the uh, gig department who had just come out from the New York office, and I said, you got to come with me. And so we got the car. We drove down to Melrose Avenue in Hollywood. And we went into a, a studio called Gold Star, and we got there just as they were doing the final mix to "I Got You, Babe." Oh wow! Yeah. And if you didn't know that was a hit, you weren't paying attention. And so uh, he agreed to co-sign him with me, and uh, we went back to the Morrison. We called the manager. They had a manager, Charlie Green. What's his name? Sorry, Charlie. What? Charlie Green and Brian Stone. They were the managers of Sonny and Cher. Okay. And so uh, there were a couple of New York hustlers who had come to L.A. and was signing everything that moved <laughs> and uh, as unknown acts. Yeah. And so uh, their story is pretty interesting. They started their, their company by sneaking into the Universal lot and going into an empty house that was used as an office and going into business. Eventually, they got caught and got kicked out, but they already had a roster in the in the public relations business by then, and and they became managers instead. Anyway, so um, I I go get the Morris House agrees to sign them, and or Harvey and I do, and and uh, uh, they had to go. The record came out. I got you, babe, and it was it was hitting in America out of L.A. first, yeah. and uh, Sonny and Cher went over to England to promote uh, your release of the single. Yeah. How's your throat? Sure. 
And so, uh, anyway, when they, the long hair was a real anomaly in those days, and Sonny and Cher tried to check into the Hilton Hotel in London, and they refused them. Because of the guy's hair, because of his hair, which isn't even that long. It's not even, it's like a page boy cut. That's like, you know. Yeah, it wasn't that long yet. You know, yeah, hair yeah. hadn't below the shoulders on guys yet. Yeah. Uh, at least they had in L.A. In, in San Francisco they had, as I learned later. But anyway, so there was such a furor over it, and the song was hitting in America so big that when they came home, there was there was already a big hit, and uh, Warner Brothers had two singles on them under an old act by the name of Caesar and Cleo. Caesar and so, what? Sorry, what was that one? Caesar and Cleo. Cleo, Cleo, like oh. Patrick. Yeah, yeah, okay. I just you dropped out there. Yeah, so Cleo, uh, Caesar and Cleo well, reprise records, puts out their Caesar and Cleo record, only they should change the name to Sonny and Cher because they're hot. Mm-hmm. And uh, I Got You, Babe, goes to number one. As it's coming down, Atlantic puts out the follow-up. So now there's two uh, hit the charts. Reprise's record hits the charts. It goes way up. As it's coming down, they release the B-side. They only had two sides. And then, um, so now there's four singles in the Billboard Top 100, and um, they're so hot that when they come back from England, uh, the the thousands of kids in the airport, literally thousands, wow. and they get off the plane. Um, so we had to take a limo down to the tarmac, and they had to leave in a limousine, and we went straight to the Morris office. Uh, because we had a, a meeting scheduled with the head of Universal Pictures to discuss a movie deal for Sonny and Cher. Wow. This, is, this is within just a few weeks of the signing. Yeah. And, and so um, we, we walked into the office of, of the head of the company, and uh, we had this meeting, and Cher was bored, and she signaled me uh, she wanted to leave, and... So she and I got in the limo. We drove around Beverly Hills and went to all the fancy ladies' stores. And she was already uh, in Vogue magazine, so they were all excited to see her. And uh, then uh, the restaurant for the music business in Hollywood in those days was called Martoni's. And it was on Coenga Boulevard. And wow. all the executives from the music business went there every night. So one night, someone picks a fight with Sonny over the air. And uh, instead of kicking the somebody out, they kicked Sonny out. <laughs> and he went home, and on a brown paper bag at the piano in his garage, he wrote a song called Laugh at Me. The next morning, he uh, came to a meeting at the Morris office and played the song in the conference room off the brown paper bag for the whole, uh, all the agents. <laughs> and... Uh, they recorded it at Gold Star that afternoon, and that night it went on the air. Are you serious? So You're gonna record it, master it, whatever, mix it, and throw it on the air one day. When you're hot, you're hot. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so God. then it, it immediately hits the charts the next week, and now Sonny and Cher had five singles in the Billboard Top 100 barely a month after we signed the air. Why did it take until 2015 for you to win the Heller Award? You should have won it in the 60s. Well, uh, I, I, I don't know why. <laughs> but I was not a manager then. I was an agent. Was, oh, okay. Uh, I was a William Morris agent, and I, I worked on a salary. I didn't, I didn't get a commission on the act or anything. Somebody got the commission. God, we're having a bit of trouble. Hang on, just hang on a second, John. Just gonna see if we can um, buffer something. It's you kind of. It might be the extra boy uh, person on the on the thing. It, it could be, Paul. but if just in case, let's have a little listen. Hey, Paul, are you on the line with your brother, or did you disappear? How's it going? Oh. Okay. Looks uh, like he's not even there. Maybe he got off. Anyway, whatever it is. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, suddenly now I'm I'm a 20th year old kid who looks like a genius. <laughs> yeah. And then, shortly thereafter, the agent that I brought in, my colleague named Harvey Kresge, um, long story short, stole the act from Charlie Green and Brian Stone, and became Sonny and Cher's manager. Quit the Morris office and went on and was the manager through the uh, TV show and. All, all the enormous success, 
And uh, I get a call from Charlie Green. Uh, and he says, I know it wasn't your fault, and I got this other band. And I said, okay, let's go see him. And uh, we went to uh, a nightclub in San Diego. It, it, was a, it was during a fog storm, and it took about five hours to drive from L.A. to San Diego, which is usually a two-and-a-half-hour drive. And we The spoke, fog we, was on the inside of the car or the outside of the car? Outside of the car okay. and inside because it, we had just gotten into smoking dope. Ah, there we go. Okay. And, uh, we smoked about five J's on the way to San Diego because <laughs> it took so long. Yeah. And when we got there, the band was on stage, and uh, it was so great that as soon as the song ended, I heard half a song, and I said, I'll sign the app. And who was and, this? Uh, wait a second. Okay. And so, and so uh, <laughs> I've told this story before, and it's all about timing. It's yeah, a punchline. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, so um, in the middle of the next song, the lead guitar throws down his guitar and runs off the stage. The rest of the band throws down their instruments, and they run after him. I turned to Charlie Green, and I said, what is this? Is this part of the show? And Charlie's as white as a sheet, and he says, no, man, this is bad. And we made our way through the crowd and out into the back, up the back door where the band had gone and uh, laid out over the back of a Corvette uh, being tended to by a nurse who had her hand in his mouth trying to keep him from swallowing his tongue was Neil Young. Oh, my God. And the band was Buffalo Springfield. Sure. And I, I committed to sign them on half a song. And it wasn't because I was stoned. It was because it was that great. That good, yeah. No, I believe that. I believe that. So, wow, that's incredible. So th you, were, you found your path. You, you, were, you knew you were on the right thing at that young age. Yes. And, and you... uh, I finally moved out of my parents' house and got a, a house in, uh, rented a house in Laurel Canyon. And um, that was, it was actually before Buffalo Springfield that, that I moved out of the house. And, I, and I, I was offered pot the first time when I was going to Santa Monica College in 1961. And I turned it down. <laughs> and and uh, I didn't smoke pot until after Chad and Jeremy's big success when I moved into Laurel Canyon. And I remember one night, one of my colleagues from the Morris office and a groupie girl who was actually a, a barber. She specialized in cutting long hair. All the hair was getting longer. And uh, they held me down. She sat on my chest while he made me smoke pot. Wow. And uh, I, I, I took a few hits, and I was um, instantly hooked. And I remember uh, listening to the Rolling Stones uh, real loud on uh, these uh, JBL speakers. And I could literally, this is, of course, a hallucination, but I could see the notes coming out of the speakers. Yeah, wow. I know that one. I know that one. <laughs> I know I, the same thing happened to me. Oh, my God. Then I went up on uh, this burned out uh, house up above my, on my, the hill behind my house. And yeah. I stood there at night and I imagined that I was flying out over the valley <laughs> and back and uh, you know it was pretty much uh, ready to try it again man that's amazing that's and amazing I went on, so, I went on to uh, secretly smoke for quite uh, you know a long time I was married to uh, a shindig dancer and her father was a cop and her brother was a cop and uh, smoking was not acceptable, especially even at the Morris office. So it was a very much a secret in those days. This is 1963. Wow. The Beatles hadn't even broken yet. And, uh, and so I had to do it very secretly. So I would, I would not smoke all day. I would smoke on my way home. I, I lived in the valley, so it was a drive. And then I would cover it up with... Uh, um, clone <laughs> and uh somehow fooled my wife for for quite some time how much would and, you say how much would you say that as a um i mean you've had this great career you're still doing it and you still know all these people and you're connected to it so without you know necessarily putting anybody on the spot um over all these decades you've been involved with this 
how how um how deeply woven into the fabric of what it is that you personally do professionally um the folks that you work with musically what what do you figure the uh the percentage or, or describe the fabric of of uh cannabis within that whole system because as little kids you know we we hear these records and i mean i heard a lot of these records when i was i was a little kid in the 60s so I heard yeah. a lot of that stuff. My sister was 14 years older than me. So when, you know, all the regular kids, the other kids were listening to Wheels on the Bus and all those Simon Says kind of things. I was listening to the Beatles and the Stones and the <laughs> Joplins and everything. So, I mean, yeah. I got a bit of an early jump on it, but I didn't know and didn't realize the depth of, of it at that time. And then I remember later on, Paul McCartney got arrested for it in Japan. And, and you know, my mom was like, oh, that's really bad. You know, and I was like, oh, boy, he got in trouble for doing this. <laughs> you know, but meanwhile, it's it's part of the whole industry, isn't it? Well, it was very much part of the fabric of the industry. And it really was part of a bigger thing which was um, the schism that occurred in America between everyone under 30 and everyone over 30. Right. Uh, it was it a was, uh, complete divide. It was even more divisive than it is today, although this one is still growing and it's going to get just as bad. Yeah. But in those days, there was an expression that everyone under 30 years, and the, and the thing was never trust anyone over 30, and then the uh, adjunct phrase was, turn on, tune in, and drop out. Right. That's and, Leary, right? Uh, Tim Leary. Yeah. Yeah. Tim Leary was the professor of that idea. And he, um, and I later on had an encounter that is interesting, that I'll get to in a minute. Okay. Uh, but um, the, the idea was that if you were against the war, you... Turned on, and pot was uh, the expression was turning on was was uh, originally applicable to smoking marijuana, and uh, and then and then as the, everyone said, it was a gateway drug, and it ultimately led to LSD. And if it wasn't for LSD, the Vietnam War would still be going on, and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. but it kept it kept the movement pacifistic. Uh, LSD was peace and love, not. Um, fascist uh, anti-fascist violence right. that, that has happened already in america this round and it will continue to grow i'm sure yeah uh but in those days that everybody was pacified and it became about flower children and uh and a mahatma gandhi dr martin luther king mandala kind of mindset where yeah. you know there was no there was, the potential for violence did not exist in the hippie community but the idea of if you didn't smoke pot you weren't on the right side of the line. Right. So every musician and everybody who worked with musicians and everybody at every record company smoked pot. And the uh, police were the enemy of pot smokers, and they were universally referred to as pigs. They, they were not oh, yeah. good people in, yeah. in the minds of them. And they didn't like the hippies either, so it was a two-way street. And... Uh, so, you know, if you, if you didn't smoke pot, the uh, idea of managing a, uh, a rock and roll band was just out of the question. And uh, it just, you know, didn't happen. And, the, and those who did it inside the Morris office, it was done secretly. Uh, we, we never, uh, you know, we hid it from the, the uh, executive corps and the people who owned and ran the company. And, and, but once I um, uh, got really committed to it, I didn't, uh, well, I, I went to San Francisco because there was a, a manager here in L.A. who, I had, when I signed Buffalo Springfield, I went way out on a limb and I, and I parlayed my success with Chad and Jeremy and my success with Sonny and Cher. And I said that this band is going to be bigger than them and it's going to be America's answer to the Beatles. Wow. And uh, I was pushing that idea all over the Morris office and this manager comes up to me and says, you're wrong. I said, what are you talking about? These guys are great. And he says, yeah, but they're not what's going to happen next. Uh, I said, well, what are you talking about? They're, you know, they're going to be the next big thing. And he says, no, the next big thing is coming out of San Francisco. Mm. And so I said, oh, yeah, what's, what do you mean? 
and uh, he says, you don't know what's happening. And I thought, I, no, I'm, I'm 23 years old. I've got two hit acts and I think a bigger act coming. And uh, I think I know everything because that's how young kids think. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. And so um, I went up to San Francisco with another colleague named Skip Taylor. And um, we went to Winterland. It was, um, I think it was October 18, 1966. And uh, Winterland was a skating rink that they turned into uh, a rock and roll venue. Bill Graham was the promoter. And uh, the bill was Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, and, and uh, Paul Butterfield Blues Band. How'd you get out alive? Well, first of all, I'd never heard of any of those acts. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like, they, the, but they drew 5,000 people to Winterland. Yeah. And I went, this is crazy. You, unknown acts don't draw. Yeah. You can't fill 5,000 seats with, you know, uh, with unknown acts. And it, it kind of blew my mind. And there were two other things that blew my mind that night. One was what they call liquid light shows, where they put different color oils in a, in a dish, a clear dish, and they put it on a magnifying screen, and they pulsate the dish to the beat of the music, and it throws... Uh, colored lights all over the wall. Oh, wow. And, That's a, yeah, I think I've seen that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, you, you see it in any Jefferson Airplane video. Yeah. Anyway, so that blew my mind. And then the next thing I saw was even more mind-boggling, and that was every guy in the room had hair below his shoulder. <laughs> yeah. And the longest I've seen was Sonny. So that, you know, really upset my apple cart, and Skip Taylor and I went out to... Uh, Lookout Point in Sausalito and looked back at the city and said, we got to bring this to L.A. So we went back to the Morris office and said, we got to open a San Francisco office. There's going to be the next big explosion. All these bands are going to come out of Frisco. And we, if we have an office there, we can capture this and make it bigger than these hippie commie managers will ever do. And, yeah. and uh, we got to do it. And they went, you guys sit down, shut up, and stay out of San Francisco. <laughs> well, if you've seen... Uh, you know, the golden <laughs> ring, and, and they tell you don't grab it. You know, you gotta, you gotta say, uh, uh oh, yeah. something's wrong. So then, Skip and I uh, schemed on um, how to bring it to San Francisco. We were in the process of signing a band to the Morris office named Canned Heat. Sure. And uh, instead of, you know, we were so we decided to leave the Morris office and start a. Um, nightclub when we when we decided to do it for buffalo springfield we called it the stampede except the morris office didn't want to do it so we left and we changed the name to the kaleidoscope and we had realized that that our bands in those days happened out of venues the beatles came out of the cave in liverpool uh the jefferson airplane was coming out of the field the grateful dead was coming out of the avalon Johnny Rivers came out of the Whiskey A Go Go. The birds came out of the Troubadour, and we said we gotta we gotta have an act yeah. to break in our nightclub. So we signed Can Heat for management instead of agency, and we um, went about raising the money to open a nightclub. And um, while that's going on, we had to get ourselves fired from the Morris office because otherwise we didn't get unemployment. Oh, I see. Sure. So we started uh, smoking in the office at night and, <laughs> and just, you know, just being totally obnoxious to everyone. And by the time we got fired, we were, um, we were, uh, we had the money and we had uh, the, the whole kaleidoscope set up and we had, uh, we released a venue and we structured the venue. It was an old uh, sound stage where the Steve Allen television show had come from. And we configured it to, for a capacity of 700 people and, it was opening night, and we booked the airplane, the dead, and our band, Canned Heat. Wow. And we showed up that afternoon. We painted the place. We created the best sound system rock had ever been on up to that point. And, uh, and we uh, went there to get ready for sound check, and there was a notification on the door that said, you can't go in here. If you do, you're going to uh, be under arrest. It was a, a restraining order from the owners of the building who had gotten complaints from all the little old ladies in the neighborhood, they didn't want hippies in their neighborhood. Right. So I'm standing there, and I and um, 
all the kids who worked for us, like 20 kids who had done all the work on the building and painted it and everything. And it's this guy named Bill Kirby says, don't tell me we did all this for nothing. And I'm standing there, and I, and I got sixty thousand dollars left in the bank, and I didn't want to. And I, the airplane and the dead were already in town, and um, I made a decision to move the concert that day for that night to some other venue. And luckily, I I knew the assistant manager at the Ambassador Hotel, where Coconut the Coconut Grove was. Oh yeah. And, I called him up and I said, is the, is the Coconut Grove book tonight? He says, yeah, what's wrong? I said, I need a venue. I need a venue tonight for 2,000, for, or at least, you know, for 700 people. And I got these bands booked. And he said, well, I got the ballroom. It holds 2,000. I said, okay, I'll take it. And he says, well, the manager's out of town. I guess I'm in charge. You got it. Because I had done him wow. a favor. I had booked his wife as the sidekick on the first Regis Philbin television show. Oh, my God. A woman named Susan Barrett. She was a Marilyn Monroe-esque dancer, really smart, really did great with with uh, with uh, Regis. Susan so Baird? Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T. Okay. Anyway, um, so Uno owed me, and he paid off, and we in one day we moved the entire sound system, went on the radio, Got the light show set up in the in the ambassador, and told everybody that it was now at the ambassador hotel. Uh, when that was all accomplished, I went home for a shower and I came back and and I'm um, walking in the building and I passed two hippies. You can always tell who was under thirty because they always had longer hair, yeah. they had low beads and they had flowery clothes, <laughs> right? And I went, oh, okay, that's two. <laughs> And then I got up to the uh, second floor where the ballroom was, and these kids who worked for us are selling tickets at the door. And I walk up, and they're grinning from ear to ear, and I said, what? And they said, take a look. And I opened the door, and uh, the airplane was on stage, and there were 2,000 people in the room. Wow. wow. Almost three times uh, what we could have gotten in our own venue. And it was a huge success. We got amazing reviews. And for the next week... I had the doors booked, and the doors had broken wide open. And uh, I went to Uno. I said, can we have it for next week? And he says, no, it's booked. So we went out, and we got a nightclub on the Sunset Strip that was called Ciro, C-I-R-O-S. And it was a famous nightclub for basically jazz music and comics. And uh, today, it is, that venue is the Comedy uh, Store, which is a huge thing in the comedy world. And um, the uh, series I'm Dying Up Here is based on that comedy store venue and the yeah. lady who ran it. Yeah. But anyway, so we moved the doors in there and changed the advertising and put out a poster. And uh, there was a mile-long line trying to get in. <laughs> so that was a huge success. The next week, uh, we had... We, we thought we had Paul Butterfield blues band book. It fell apart. We snagged the knack that was being heavily promoted at the time from MCA records and said, they better be good because if they're not, they'll never work this town again. And they weren't good. And, and, um, so who was that? Do you know? That was, it was called fever tree. That band. Fever tree. Fever tree. And yeah. it was, a. Uh, a brand new act that MCA had put a huge billboard on Sunset that had uh, 3D. It was like a woman in a swamp pulling a band on the raft, and the band was on the raft, and it was 3D, so it looked like she was actually pulling them. Anyway, it was a big hype, and uh, the band got to play, and they weren't good, and um, their career ended in, in pretty much that day. Anyway, um, so now we shut down, and we went out and looked for another venue, and we ended up leasing an, an amazing, legendary venue on, on Sunset Boulevard, not on the Strip, but in Hollywood, called the Earl Carroll Theater, okay. which was built in the 30s as a uh, nightclub for uh, stage shows and dancing, and it, it has an amazing history. And we uh, in there, went in there, we built a dance floor out of an old bowling alley. We bought an old bowling alley the, the, at the Lanes, 
and installed it in this place as because the whole concept of that era was dance concerts. You had to be able to dance, and the and the um, the Earl Carroll Theater, which had been the Moulin Rouge in the fifties, it was actually built in the thirties, uh, didn't have a dance floor. So so we built a dance floor, and uh, when in, and our opening night was Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, Canned Heat once again. And in both situations, the one at the Ambassador and the one in our own venue, all three acts played for free. Oh, wow. Nice. They didn't charge us anything because they wanted us to bring their San Francisco to play. And we ended up bringing all the San Francisco acts down here first. Uh, you know, Big Brother and the Holding Company, Moby Grape, uh, uh, the Charlatans, all the, all the great bands in San Francisco. We were their debut performance in Los Angeles, including the dead. And uh, we went on and had another amazing adventure that is too long and too fabulous to tell now. Oh, gosh. But uh, it was uh, all, all through that, we smoked all day, every day. Wow. Gee whiz. And it was, it was, it was the, well, the time of my life. How would you say good. your health has been over the course of your life? Have you had a pretty good... Time My health has been extremely good for, for this reason. Uh, after the kaleidoscope closed, I ended up um, managing a, a little band called Rock and Foo. And my brother Phil had just graduated from high school. And he came over to my house one day with um, a book called Yoga, Youth, and Reincarnation. Okay. And I read the book and I got into yoga big time and uh, I became a health nut and uh, I've been practicing yoga and vegetarianism ever since and that uh, along with meditation has kept me young vital and healthy and I, I've never had a major disease I've broken a bunch of bones driving stone oh yeah uh, I had I think five or six auto accidents matter of fact I once calculated that I wrecked every car I had except the fastest one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really? At the height of success, I drove an Aston Martin DBS, and I drove it one time 155 miles an hour, but I never wrecked it. Uh, and uh, anyway, so um, my health is very good and still is to this day. And and I, I get I'm 77 years old. I wow. get guests. I get guests at my in my early 60s uh, by uh, uh, people all the time. So I I'm not. As old looking as I am, sure. <laughs> apparently, I, and, are you uh, still you're still working? At, you still work professionally in the music business too, right? No, I, I actually retired from the music business last uh, last year. Um, I had been teaching music business at a Musicians Institute in Hollywood, and that got me into Loyola Marymount University, where I taught for ten years. I, I was professor of the year three times in the School of Film and Television, and yeah. uh, then. Then I taught at UCLA uh, for seven years, and all along I was dabbling, kind of looking for an act. Um, I found one at LMU, uh, a, a girl named Simone Battle. I thought she was going to be a superstar, uh, but I, she didn't. She wouldn't follow my advice. Yeah, and so I let her go, and when all my advice turned out to be absolutely correct. Instead of coming back to me, and I invited her to do so, and I even wrote my book, uh, Rock Building Bands in the Digital Age, as a guidebook for her, she killed herself instead. Oh, gosh. That's too broke bad. My heart. Uh, she was in a band called Girl, G-R-L. Uh, I think it was on uh, RCA. Yeah. And uh, produced by Dr. Luke. And I told her that kind of band wasn't going to make it today, and she should not do it. And she insisted on doing it, and uh, they tried real hard, but they couldn't break the act, and it broke yeah, her. That's too bad. What, what do you mean that it wouldn't work today? What exactly about it wouldn't it work? Was, it was uh, it was the five hottest chicks you ever saw in one place in your life. Oh, okay. And that's and not going to work. It was no. I, I knew it wasn't going to work because it was uh, the the lady who put it together was the manager of the Pussycat Doll. Right. And she, and she was trying to duplicate her success. And that was not going to happen in the current market. Right. Part of being a great manager is having vision and knowing what's real and what's not real because I never met an artist in 
60 years of management that didn't think it was going all the way to the big time. Not one, ever, right? And that, and 90% of them were absolutely wrong. They weren't even going to make a living. Right. So a manager has to know um, what to go on and what to not go on. And I, I told her, okay, this is going to be a learning experience for you. When it's over, come back to me. I was leading her down the direction that Adele later had huge success with. Wow. And she got into this cute all-girl band that, you know, danced and sang, didn't play instruments, oh, God. And, uh, and didn't write their song, and wasn't going to make it. And when, it, when she realized that it wasn't going to happen, she um, hung herself in her apartment so it was really like a, a poorly conceived never going to work sort of a monkeys right where they're not really they're not really doing well, much of the they're just sort of puppeting along with something like a little well yeah i mean is it, but but see the monkeys was actually a brilliant idea at the time yeah but i mean that's what they're, they're doing <laughs> a thing where they're not really idea. gonna they're gonna play the instruments and just jump around and, and just be cute and that's supposed to work that's not gonna work is it i mean the best people yeah. to do that were the the spice girls maybe yeah, well, the, the Spice Girls and the Pussycat Dolls were similar things. I mean, that was in the 80s when that kind of thing had MTV to hype it. Yeah. And, uh, and it worked because they were hot. But to, to do it in the, in the market, uh, you know, that, that Simone Battle was um, entering, it wasn't good. I knew 100% that even with Sony distributed uh, record label, Dr. Luke, the hottest producer of the day, the best choreographers and a lot of money that that band was going to fail. And uh, when it did, she couldn't take it, and she didn't come back to me. She broke my heart instead. Yeah, that's too bad. Well, let's let's put a happier note on it. I mean, this fella also didn't go the distance, but if I don't ask you about Elvis Presley, I'll be kicking myself. Uh, what well, that's, of- even better, that's an even better story. Uh, when, I, when you start the William Morris Agency trains their agents from the mail room up. They don't, they don't hire, at least in those days, they didn't hire agents from the outside or other agencies. What they did was they put you in the mail room at $50 a week, and when I started in 1961, and they um, tested you in every possible way to see what kind of character you had, what kind of intelligence you had, what kind of humility you had, and if you uh, were a persevering type. And... Um, so getting the job was hard in the first place because it took someone had to recommend you. I, I was luckily recommended by an agent there, and uh, I got and I was actually an actor looking for work, but I didn't know how to get uh, to be, get an effective agent. So I did, I lied about being an actor, said I wanted to be an agent, and uh, got the job because I was trying to find out how to get an agent, right. and. Uh, Two days into it, I said, I can do this better than any of these guys. And I started running, and six months later, I was the fastest guy in the mailroom. Well, every year, uh, uh, William Morris had a a guy from the mailroom who worked directly for Colonel Tom Parker at the height of Elvis' movie career. He was a a liaison between the uh, Elvis camp and the Morris office. And it was just the colonel hustling a free staff member, you know, and it was a flunk. I was a flunky gopher type. Uh, but they sent me, the kid who worked for them, uh, for Colonel full time, was named Riff Schechter, and he went in the Air Force Reserves every summer for two weeks. And the colonel, tough old buzzard that he was, insisted that somebody replace him for those two weeks as the gopher. Okay. So, so they always sent the guy who was least likely to screw up because they didn't want the colonel complaining. So I got the gig, and I went over there for what was supposed to be two weeks, and it was amazing to see, you know, the king of rock and roll's operation yeah. at the highest possible level. And um, and two weeks in, I went to the colonel on the Friday, and I said, Colonel, thanks for the opportunity. Irving will be back on Monday, and it was really amazing. He says, oh, no, no, Johnny, you come back on Monday, too. I said, well, sir, they're expecting me back at the office. He said, no, no, I'll handle that. <laughs> End of discussion. <laughs> so the, the colonel uh, ended up keeping me on his staff for the better part of a year. And um, uh, it, was, it was just amazing. And, and I, I was um, 
we were at Paramount Pictures. The Colonel always got something for free in every deal he did. And what he got in a multiple picture deal with the great producer, Hal Wallace, was half the uh, second floor of the main building at Paramount Pictures for free. Seven room suite. Wow. And uh, nice. every square inch was covered with a picture of Elvis. You just have to manage Elvis to get that perk. Well, he was, you know, his deal with Elvis was, I'll only manage you. Right. But you have to do whatever I say, and I get half. Right. And so Elvis went along, and and uh, and that, that was their relationship. But the colonel was a tough old nut. Yeah. And he he didn't, um, you know, he, he like when he when he signed Elvis to RCA Records, he got a full time RCA employee on his staff named Graylin Landon, who was a press agent. So all of Elvis's press didn't emanate from the record company; it emanated from the colonel's office by this guy Graylin. So that was just the colonel's M.O. He always got something for free in the deal. And uh, in the Morris office, he wanted free, uh, three free things. He wanted an office in the building. He wanted a full-time employee on his staff. And he wanted a free station wagon, gas insured, and uh, serviced by William Morris. Station well, they gave, wagon. <laughs> yeah, they gave him a station wagon. That was easy. They had a whole fleet. Yeah. They gave him. A guy from the mailroom, that's only 50 bucks a week, no big deal. Yeah. But an office, an office in the William Morris building was hugely expensive. So uh, Mr. Lashfogel, the head of William Morris, said to him, Listen, Colonel, there's no office in this building good enough for you, yeah. except mine. So whenever you're in the building, you come and use my office, and I will um, um, move into my other office. <laughs> and so... Uh, uh, Lashfold kind of uh, upshopped him in that move, but he got the the staff member and uh, eventually me and the and the car. Wow! And so anyway, um, I met Elvis on the set of a movie called Girls, Girls, Girls one day in a group of people, just to not say hello and shake hands. And um, then one day, they moved over to MGM Studios to make a movie called It Happened at the World's Fair. Yeah. And uh, I was left alone in the seven-room suite with all these pictures of Elvis on the walls, and and uh, my Virgo brain couldn't take it, and I had nothing to do except I, I went to all the studios where Elvis ever made a movie, and collected his fan mail, went back to the office, uh, read it, and if anything was interesting, I sent it to this warehouse in Madison, Tennessee, and my other job was to buy every newspaper and every magazine and go through it and anything about Elvis I would send to this warehouse and and but I never uh, I only got like a few phone calls a day one in the morning at nine o'clock to make sure I was there one at five to one to let me go to lunch one at five after two to make sure I was back and one at five to five to tell me to go home wow pretty punctual so, yeah so the rest of the time I took down all the pictures and I put them all back up. They were all laid out on, on in the seven room suites uh, asymmetrically, and I took them all down and put them all back up symmetrically, where the wallet size calendars were the ring around the uh, top of the uh, walls, and then the certain size went in the middle, and it, it turned it into this uh, rather uh, um, pretty work of art. And after they finished the movie at MGM, they came back. No one ever mentioned, I don't even know if they noticed it, but no one ever mentioned that all the pictures were changed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was funny. That's anyway, amazing. So, that's a great so, uh, start. You know, that's an amazing okay. story. While they were over at MGM one day, I got a call to bring this, uh, these papers over to the colonel. And uh, I, in those days, I was only making 50 bucks a week. And I had this, uh, this, uh, 59 Ford Galaxy convertible where the the top was split from stem to stern on both sides and the thing was so funky it looked like it could grow moss on it oh, wow. and the colonel loved to be dripping uh, driven around in this old car right yeah. he thought it was he sit in the back like it was a limo and I would drive him so I drive on I get I have a pass to drive onto the lot and I go to his office and I walk in and and I go into his his uh, private office and and i hand him the papers oh johnny come on yes and i give him the papers he says oh and, and he says you know elvis and <laughs> i look over and elvis is standing leaning against the wall and i gotta tell you it was like being in the room with a fire i mean it was so intense to be in the room with this 
absolutely gorgeous human being who is the, the king of rock and roll and a major movie star and a, a guy I was a fan of since high school in Canada. Wow. What year uh, was that? What, like, how old were you about? I was, at this time, I was um, maybe 22. 22, and there he is standing right in front of you. And and you're telling me you had certain way, there was an indescribable uh, air of greatness. Is that is that how it, we it can... Was, it was an aura, like a, as hot as a fire. <laughs> and it was like looking at a fireplace, only it was him standing there. And he, he says, you know, you know Elvis. And I look over and... Elvis walks toward me and he sticks out his hand and I stick out mine. We shake hands. He says, "How you? How you?" He says, uh, um, "How do you do, sir?" Oh wow! Now he calls me sir because I'm wearing a suit and a tie. Sure. Which was compulsory at uh, William Morris. Yeah. Not as I'm older. I'm actually much younger than him uh, by at least I think maybe a few years at least. Yeah. We probably calculate that, but anyway, so. Um, I just shook hands with the king of rock and roll, and I'm like walking on air. And the colonel says, "Well, wait outside for me, and you can drive me home." And so I, I turn and I start to leave the room, and Elvis walks over and he opens the door for me, and he says, "See ya, man." Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> As only good. Right? God. And so the colonel gets in the car. We drive out, and we're actually we're driving. We're driving through the. We're driving through the main... How's your throat? I'm good. I'm okay. I just had to clear it okay. up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're driving through the main gate, and the president of um, MGM Pictures is walking toward the gate. And the gate is from the 30s, and it's very narrow, and, and the car almost fills the gate. And so uh, the colonel says, stop the car, Johnny. And I stop right in the middle of the arch of the gate, and... Uh, he waits for uh, Robert Whiteman, the, the president of MGM, to get right up next to the car, and then he sticks his hand through the hole in the roof, and he says, Mr. Whiteman! And uh, Whiteman steps over, and he looks down into the hole, and he takes Colonel's hand and shakes it. He says, are you in there, Colonel? And the Colonel says, yes, sir. Uh, make sure you go by the set and say hello to Elvis. And he said, yes, sir, I will. And he says, okay, Johnny, drive on. <laughs> and I drive away, and the Colonel laughed all the way home. Oh, that's amazing. Fun. Hey, listen, when you were with Elvis, I mean, th th this is my brief, uh, I don't have any kind of story like that, but I did go to uh, Graceland, and when you were with Elvis, and he was alive and everything, obviously it wasn't when he was at his larger size yet, when you met him, right? I mean, he was he was right. at the perfect physical height. So when you met him, like, how tall of a man, because the thing that really struck me when I was in, um, when I was in Graceland, and you can go on a tour there, they have a lot of the uh, clothing that he wore on stage. So there's that famous, the iconic white suit with all of the sparkles. And I couldn't believe how small it was. I mean, yeah, I would say that he was he was no taller than me. Uh, I think he was probably about five nine. Five nine. And God, uh, that's speaking of his clothing, um, the colonel was also a very cheap guy. That's why he wanted everything free. And one day, uh, Irving, and he was moving from an apartment in Hollywood, the colonel was, to a house in Beverly Hills. And he made Irving and I take all his stuff, everything but the furniture, in the station wagon over to the new house. And while we were doing that, I found that gold lame jacket oh, wow. in the colonel's closet. And I wore it all afternoon. Oh, oh that's amazing. You're wearing Elvis. You, get any, you would have had a selfie back then. No, <laughs> you wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, uh, we didn't have a selfie. Uh, we should have gone to one of those photo booths. <laughs> yeah, lost selfie moment. Look at this. I got Elvis's jacket on. That's amazing. Oh my God. So you would um, you would say that you you use uh, overall throughout your life. You you would say you've uh, been using cannabis on a what would we call a regular basis, whatever that might be for you. That's part of your daily makeup or your your weekly. Uh, you know, you make sure you're close to it from time to time. Let me put it this way. I, I smoked my first J on my way to the office. I sat at my desk all day. This is this is as a manager, right. not as. Um, and I smoked um, all day every day, chain smoked it, and um, intermittently uh, took acid, mescaline, uh, psilocybin. Uh, there was a there was a thing that happened among the hippie community where the, the idea was they lied about pot. What else did they lie about? 
Yeah. And the assumption was they lied about everything. Yeah, we're on that so, now. And we're, we're really balls deep in that kind of mindset these days, I guess. Yeah. So whenever a new drug came along, it was kind of incumbent upon you to at least try it once, just so you knew what it was. Yeah. And it came along, DMT. There, there was even one summer that was really classic during the kaleidoscope era where uh, the great chemist, uh, Owsley Stanley, who made all the great LSD, uh, made um, synthetic cannabis, a powder wow. that you could drop or snort. Wow. And uh, it was so hard to make and so deadly if you didn't make it right that he only made one pound in his entire life. And I actually ended up with an ounce of that. <laughs> and wow. that was that was about the greatest cannabis high I've ever had. You know, that that was absolutely the full impact of everything cannabis can be locked for the duration of a, a, a couple of hours. And uh, it was it was pretty amazing. Otherwise, I smoked pretty much all the time for years and years. And uh, all of our clients smoked. Um, one of our clients, uh, um, a great comedy act on Columbia Records called the Fire Sign Theater. Oh, sure, yeah. They would they wouldn't even sign with us until we confirmed that we smoke. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, best. Yeah, and uh, so anyway, I uh, I smoked constantly, chain smoke virtually until um, um, I ended up teaching. And when I started teaching, I, I quit for the semester, and I would, um, you know, um, smoke this, uh, <laughs> on the last day of school, <laughs> I'd be smoking before I left the campus. Uh, and uh, then I'd smoke all through the break, and then, um, so uh, I was just dealing with a text. Um, and so I, I, uh, I smoked again, you know, regularly, and then... Last year, I uh, got some clones from a company in San Jose, California, called King Clone Brand. Sure. And I grew, I grew the like the most fantastic pot I'd ever seen. I had, uh, I think, eight plants out here in my in my yard, and I had so much pot, and it was so good, and it was free, <laughs> that I probably oversmoked, and I ended up getting. Um, a sinus problem. Oh wow! And uh, so the last I haven't smoked since New Year's Eve. Oh wow! And for the first time in my life, I uh, other than short periods of semester length, which at the longest was sixteen weeks, um, I haven't smoked now in uh, six months. Gee whiz! And uh, you know it, it's interesting. Uh, I, I still feel real good. Like like I use pot pretty much as what um, Chad Stewart from Chad and Jeremy called a comative uh, to reduce stress and uh, kind of as a reward for doing the insane work of being a manager. Right. So met a lot of crazy people. But right? you feel good not being on it for six months, seven months. Yeah, you know the um, even when I quit for school, I, I, it, it was hard for me to kick. I would have so much in my system that the withdrawal would actually be quite intense, and I would get uptight and, and ornery and uh, stressed out and uh, uncomfortable uh, until I went through a week or two, and then it would start to mellow out, and I ended up feeling you know, just as good straight as I did high. And uh, so now I'm six months into being straight, it still and, feels uh, good. Just don't change I it. Say, I feel fabulous. Yeah. You know, I just uh, it's what it, whichever camp I'm in at the time is the one I prefer. Right. Okay. Well, listen. Right. This is great. I, before we go, I do want to spend a little bit of time on your your current efforts. So um, <clears throat> these all would have come from your uh, your smoke filled mind, your cannabis fueled mind, because uh, in 2008. And it's still going on. I mean, of course, you've had this great musical career. And we should also mention, I need to mention some of the other acts. I mean, we could do a story about each one, but we don't really have time. But Peter, Paul, and Mary, of course, Poco, and then your brother Phil designed their very iconic horse album cover. America, another one he also did. Um, Crosby, Stills, or Crosby and Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, uh, Dw Dwight Tilly, 
uh, all kinds of people. Let me just quickly ask you this. What, how, what was the uh, the circle of connection between you and, say, Polko and America and your brother? Like, did you bring him in? Were they looking for album art uh, artists, or how did that work out? It was uh, uh, I had a company called Hartman and Goodman. Um, basically, I got involved in that circle with Buffalo Springfield, which is where Poco came from. That was Richie Fure, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. That was Stephen Stills, Neil Young. They were all in Poco or in uh, Buffalo Springfield. Yeah. So, so once I was their agent, and I really delivered for them. I mean, they got a number one record on their first record, right? For, uh, it was actually their one, two, I think it was their fourth single, but but it went to number one. Uh, for what it's worth, it's in every movie about the 60s. Uh, it, it was about a riot on Sunset Strip when they tore down a nightclub called Pandora's Box. So that started it, and and then eventually what happened was David, I had, uh, re- after the kaleidoscope closed, I kind of retired because I, I, I wanted to be an actor, writer, film producer, director guy in my early career. That's really what I was studying for and training for. And so I, I started screenwriting. And uh, I was in L.A. one time, and I ran, there was a place where all the populists hung out called uh, the Troubadour Bar. It was a nightclub. And um, I was in there one night, and David Geffen, uh, the legendary guy who managed and built uh, DreamWorks and is the most, he made more money in the music industry than anybody else ever. And he was managing Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young and Joni Mitchell and Laura Nero and a a bunch of other acts, and he was starting Asylum Records. And um, I run into him, and he tells me that Neil's here. And Neil, he says, I said, I'll go get him. And he brings Neil out to see me. And uh, Neil Young gives me this big, huge hug, and he stands there. He's holding me in his arms like he would a chick. And and then and we're we're you know exchanging small stuff, and and uh, and then he he lets go. I mean, he takes it two or three steps away, and he turns back. And the, every, Now, this is the height of Crosby, Sills, Nash, and Young, right? Yeah. Deja period. And everybody in the room at a pack bar is staring at him, and he says to me, thank you, man. And I kind of broke into a giggle and said, sure, Neil. <laughs> you know, and um, Geffen saw that Neil loved me. And Neil was his toughest case, you know. Neil was the most critical artist. He was the the most powerful, he was the most intelligent and, and most creative. And, and uh, he was always giving Geffen a hard time. And so Geffen, you know, invited me to lunch and he kept taking me to lunch. And finally, he, and he was trying to get me to come to work for him. And uh, I said, no, I, I want to be a screenwriter. I, I don't want to uh, have a job. I don't do jobs anymore. And he says, listen, come and do this. You got to help me out. If you're still here in a year, I'll give you a piece. Well, a year later, I had broken um, Neil Young's record. Um, the album was Harvest, and the single was Heart of Gold, and both went to number one. I booked his his biggest tour up to that time and made him a ton of money, and I had all these other acts. We'd taken on the Eagles. I'm one of the Cowboys. We actually put the Eagles together with uh, John Boylan, the great record producer who managed, manages Linda Ronstadt, right. even to this day. And... Uh, we ended up, um, uh, I worked for Geffen, I became a partner, uh, as happens a lot of times with moguls, we had, we had a fight, and um, I quit Geffen to go manage my, with my own company, with my assistant, whose name was Harlan Goodman, we became Hartman and Goodman, and we signed Poco, because they had just fired us for, uh, because it became obvious to them that we only signed them, Geffen signed them, to steal Richie Fure to be in a band called Souther Hillman and Fure, which is going to be his next Crosby, Stills, and Nash. So I, I was in the middle of that. I didn't like it. Geffen and I had other problems getting along. And so Harlan and I left, signed Poco, and then we got them rolling without Richie Fure and actually took them to greater heights than they'd ever been. Our success with them attracted America, who I managed as part of Geffen's company, uh, what Geffen Roberts' company was called. Elliot Roberts was his partner. And um, so Crosby and Nash were being neglected after we left, and they came over. And as soon as I had them, I called Stills as manager, and we put Crosby, Stills, and Nash back together. Wow. And, 
And then we had a huge success with them, which attracted Peter, Paul, and Mary, who had been broken up for years. And uh, our attorney, um, Bruce Gray Cal, had been, he's Ringo's attorney for his entire career. And um, he delivered, he, he represented Mary Travers. He delivered Peter, Paul, and Mary to us. We, we uh, did their reunion tour and album. And, uh, uh, you know, at the height of Hartman and Goodman, we were simultaneously the managers of Peter, Paul, and Mary, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, America, Poco, the Firesign Theater, Michael Murphy, Dwight Twilley, yeah. and Happy Baby Band. So Incredible. we were the biggest management company in music at that time. And um, then uh, well, at the height of that, I got a chance to produce a movie called Hard Country based on a Michael Murphy song. And that was Kim Basinger's first starring role in a feature film. And uh, I got the old fever back to be in the, to write movies, which is what I'd always wanted to do. And um, leading us up to the rest of your question, um, I, well, I, I kind of had only, once the Simone Battle wasn't ready to play, take management advice from me, I pretty much, uh, I put together, I think, one other band, and it broke up before its debut, and I um, decided to give up the music business altogether, and that was aided by... Um, a year ago, last May, I was in an auto accident where I broke my back, and I had to take a year off to recover, which I've done, and I'm back to normal. And uh, but in the interim, I stopped teaching at uh, UCLA. I was teaching music business, and uh, got back into my screenwriting. And I uh, I just turned in the 29th draft uh, of a <laughs> script I started writing in 1979. Wow. And, and it's in play, and uh, as you called, I'm in the middle of a rewrite on a, um, a screenplay called uh, Hourglass. The, the log line on the, on the first, the, the, my teachers, uh, my screenwriting teachers always said, write about what you know best, and what I knew best was the music business, so Dream Street is the name of the script, and it's about the music business that we've been discussing, uh, the 70s era. Okay, real yeah. quick, we've got a couple of questions. I've got a couple more questions, and we have to get going. Real quick, your call. Why did the show Vinyl not work? I don't know. I never saw it. I didn't want to see it because I didn't want it to interfere with my writing of Dream Street, which is what was happening in California at that very time. I see. Uh, yeah. I think I'll probably go watch it now, just out of curiosity that I finished my script. Uh, uh, the log line on my script is, uh, an unscrupulous manager, desperate to save his crumbling empire, gathers the drug-shattered, iconic rock band that made him famous and puts them on the comeback trail. Oh, that's amazing. I love the sound of that. Hey, and then uh, slightly away from that, I mean, talking about music, of course, your whole career has been centered around that. Tell me a little bit about... And then we have to get going soon, but I want you to close up. First of all, if there's anywhere that uh, people can get a hold of you, if you have a Twitter handle, etc. But I really want to hear about the Holodime Foundation. You've been doing that for 10 years. Tell people what that is, because um, as I understand it, you know, you're trying to you're trying to foster a, a new generation uh, of music. And so what exactly are you bringing to people? And with the coda on that question being... I don't know, man. I just hear a lot of stuff these days. I don't really like it. So am I yeah. old, or are you trying to help people bring new good stuff? You know, we can go more uh, with Adele and, and these other, the quality of acts that you've been wrestling with over the past decades. Do we have any ways to pull characteristics and find things like that about musicians? Do we have another uh, bevy of talent uh, ahead of us, or is it all just manufactured pap? Or somewhere in we between. Have, new talent will come along. Paul Simon said it in a song. Every generation puts a hero up the pop charts. No one, the hero for this generation has not arrived yet. The holodime, the mission statement for the holodime is to ensure that the next generation of music belongs to those who create it. Now, here's how it works. The website, holodime, H-L-O-L-O-D-I-G-M, like paradigm, it's hologram meets paradigm, music.com, or the holodime, or 20 different spelling, misspellings, you'll get there. And what you have there is more than 30 hours of classroom lectures, the exact course that I taught at LMU that those students paid $4,000 to take 
is online, available, absolutely free. Can you just okay? say that again one more time for people? Because this is like a massive gift, and I want folks to understand that. Just just tell us that one more time. Okay. The Holodyne, whose mission statement is to ensure that the next generation of music belongs to those who create it, not transnational corporations, right. is, is, uh, contains more than 30 hours of actual classroom lectures. The entire course that I taught at Musicians Institute in Hollywood, Loyola Marymount University for 10 years, they paid $4,000 to take that course. I taught it at UCLA for seven years. I was professor of the year in those institutions four different times. And the course is the absolute truth. Uh, and the textbook that goes with it that I wrote called Rock Building Bands in the Digital Age is available on that website absolutely free. I have given away totally thousands of copies online for free. You can download it. And between the lectures in that book, it tells you exactly what's happening in the music business today, exactly how to direct your own career, and how to end up owning your own masters, your own publishing, and your own merchandising, and how to generate a career that if you're talented, <laughs> if you're talented, and trust me, like I said earlier, I never met a band that didn't think it was going all the way, <laughs> and 90% of them won't even make a living. 1% yeah. will make 90% of the money. But if you think you're great, and trust me, good isn't enough anymore. It has to be great. Then you go there. You read that book, and you watch those lectures. There are also guest lectures from artists, managers, producers, other people on that website that will tell you how this game is played, how it works, and how to operate it. it the whole course was designed to train personal managers in the music industry. And there's a, a, the holodyme itself is a visualization that I created so that I can show you how to play the game of showbiz in a one and a half hour lecture Amazing. with a visual that shows you what it looks like. The The holodyme is what showbiz would look like if it was a board game. Amazing. That is absolutely amazing. That's fantastic. So look great. that up. H O L O D I G M, Holodyme, like holo, holo, uh, hologram and paradigm. Look it up. Yeah. It's been going on for yeah. 10 years now. Thank you so much for that gift. And it's holodymemusic.com or theholodyme.com. Okay? Amazing. If any questions, people can address me directly at John Hartman, J O H N H A R T M A N N 22 at gmail.com. I welcome anybody who wants to have a career in music to contact me with their questions and I will give you free advice because music is the most powerful tool on the planet. And it used to be in service to humanity. Today it is in service to um, the greedy <laughs> Uh, people who are doing it for the gold chains, the Bentleys and the babes, not to change the world. Right. And I, I've trained and worked with the best musicians who devoted their careers to fixing what's broken on this planet and changing the war and turning away from war to peace. Well, that says it all right there. Thank you for put together for the last 10 years to continue that. Folks, I hope you understand how generous uh, a gift that is. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, Thank you, Alan. Just, just for the heck of it, we're going to throw on a little fever tree. This is San oh, Francisco wow. Girls. And these guys aren't very good, according to you. So this is no, for... no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it blew their career because they had an opportunity that they didn't fulfill. They weren't ready. They were a young baby band. Right. They were putting up on the place with Airplane and the Doors, who had, were seasoned veterans. It's uh, pretty trippy. It. Yeah, but I, I'd like to hear it myself. <laughs> That's great stuff. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on the show, Mr. John Hartman. I hope uh, I hope it was okay for you. We had a great time. We learned a lot of cool stuff. So thanks very much. I'm glad to speak to everybody in the homeland. I miss you, you guys. Ah, uh, you too. Yes, don't forget, folks, John was born here as a Canadian before he uh, was absconded with down to the States and gave us some of the finest music of the last 50 years. Uh, this this track here may not be in that canon, but it's still kind of fun to listen to. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Cheers. Fever Tree, folks. Wow. Yeah, that's... It's 
kind of trippy, actually. It's, I've never heard of these guys. That's the part that really interested me. I was like, who are they? I mean, you know, you know who all the crummy ones are. It just, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to deal that this is, that song came out 50 years ago. All right. So now where are we? We have to close this show out. We've only got a couple of seconds left to go. Uh, not really much at all, but I do have another uh, quick couple of things I got to read here. Uh, for you, remember just before we had John come on that the chief medical officer here in uh, Toronto, which is a pretty large city, uh, is proposing in a uh, report called a public health approach to drug policy that will be presented to the has already been presented to the city's health board. Um, this is a great idea. Have a look at Portugal and what they do about all of this um and in australia we will go out on this final bit of news in australia unfortunately um <laughs> they're so uptight there we have our friend jenny hallam who is in kind of a lot of trouble and uh, we don't know how that's going to go but this is not a good piece of news to understand um that um gee whiz listen to this nonsense while other parts of the world are decriminalizing cannabis, South Australia plans to quadruple fines and introduce prison terms. The South Australian Liberal Party ran a war on drugs slogan in April, and today it delivered on that promise. What are you doing over there, folks? Announcing new laws to be debated in Parliament this week, including the proposals of a maximum fine for cannabis possession of $2,000 plus a two-year jail term. A cap on a number of times a person can enter a drug diversion program, allowing drug-sniffing dogs into schools. Attorney General Vicki Chapman uh, says the changes would make the penalty for possession of marijuana the same as it is for heroin. Hey, if that makes any sense to you, you're mentally unwell. So uh, write your congressman or your whoever it is in uh, Australia that you need to speak with. I mean, that is just... It's just not on, you know. I I don't understand why they don't understand. <laughs> wow. Anyway, this has been. This has been Green Crush. Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Thanks again to our guest, John Hartman, brother of Paul and Phil. If there are any more Hartman Brothers, please send your resume to the show. We have a soft spot for all of you. If there's any other hidden siblings out there, any other Hartmans, you've all done well so far. <laughs> so uh, thanks for uh, listening to the show, and do join us again next week, won't you? And let's end it right now.